הבהרה, התוכן המשודר מבוסס על עדויות אישיות של מרואיינים אשר נאמרו על דעתם בלבד. אין לראות בתוכן משום המלצה כלשהי לרבות המלצה רפואית ו/או נפשית, ואין לראות בו משום עידוד לביצוע פעולות כלשהן. שלום לכולם, ברוכים הבאים לפודקאסט המצולם של איינס ישראל. בפודקאסט הזה אנחנו נארח אורחים שעברו חוויית סף מוות כמו הילה, אורחים מהארץ ומהעולם. אנחנו נתחיל בכמה אורחים מהעולם, וכל פודקאסט כזה יוקדש לסיפור NDE, New Death Experience, של, של אדם כזה. את רוצה לספר על האורח הראשון שלנו, הילה? כן, רק לפני אני רוצה להגיד שאם יש מישהו שחווה את החוויה הזאת ומתקשה לדבר עליה ומרגיש ש... שיש לו מה להגיד ובדרך כלל כל מי שחווה את החוויה הזאת מרגיש, מרגיש איזשהו דחף להוציא את המידע הזה כי המידע הזה הוא לא באמת שלנו אז הוא מוזמן לפנות אלינו בין אם זה ל... פייסבוק הפרטי ש... שלי או של איינס ישראל. אפשר לחפש בפייסבוק החיים שאחרי החיים. לגבי מי שאנחנו מארחים היום, ג'פרי אולסן, הנשמה היקרה, מזכה אותנו כאן בלספר את הסיפור שלו. חוץ מזה שהוא עבר את החוויה שלו, הוא עוזר לאנשים רבים ברחבי העולם. Uh, בין אם זה טיפול, uh, ליווי אישי או קבוצתי. כמו uh, קאוצ'ר. בדיוק, כמו קאוצ'ר. שלום, ג'פרי. הלו, ג'פרי. הלו. שלום, שלום, והפי חנוכה. תודה רבה. 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 beautiful time. Thank you. Um, I wanted to outline the near-death experience and talk about that, and we'll have plenty of time to, to get to questions. So my near-death experience was caused by an automobile accident, and I was driving with the whole family, my wife, my children, two boys, two sons. And uh, the difficult part about the story is I lost control of the car. I was driving. And I lost control of the car. And um, there was some interesting things leading up to that moment, however, that I just want to touch upon. Because I think it's important um, to, to know these things. We had been visiting my wife's family. And as we were leaving the house, you know, and, and she was waving to her mother and her father, um, you know, our children's grandparents, um, Tan, Tan, Tamara, my wife stopped me. She said, wait, wait, wait. I need to go say goodbye to mom and dad one more time. And I watched as she got out of the car and ran to the porch. And she not only hugged her mother and father, but she kissed them both. And, and I watched as that happened. Now at the time, you know, it's always hindsight that we see these things, but somewhere she had a whisper. I want to go say goodbye to mom and dad one more time, which she did. And then as we were driving the car, she hugged, she kissed them, she got in the car, I'm driving up the road. And there was a moment that I was looking in the rear view mirror of the car, when you just look in the mirror to see the traffic behind you. And I noticed my youngest son, who was just a toddler, just 14 months old, and I felt him. I thought, boy, look at that little boy. What a miracle in our life that he's here. And I heard my oldest son, who was seven at the time, he was playing in the back seat, playing with action figures, characters. And I heard his joyful noise of a little boy. And then I looked at uh, Tamara, my wife, and she was still holding onto my hand. I was driving with this hand and she was holding onto my hand and she had uh, fallen asleep. She had laid her seat back and was resting, actually, Griffin, my youngest son, was also sound asleep when I looked in the rearview mirror. But there was this moment of gratitude, this moment of absolute peace, thinking, wow, look at the beauty that is around me in, in this connection of my family. 
And, you know, you may have family and friends yourself. There are these beautiful heart connections. And, and I experienced that in a very profound way. And it was about an hour after that, that the accident happened. Now, there was reports of very heavy winds, you know, very windy. And there was reports of a big truck, you know, driving erratically on the interstate. I believe I may have... Um, maybe dozed off, just dozed for, for just, just a minute, just a moment, just a second, but then I, I swerved. And when I swerved, I overcorrected and the car began to go and I lost control of the car and the car began to roll, not off the road, but down the hard concrete of the road. And it was a horrific accident. I, I blacked out for most of that. Um, but when the car stopped, I was completely conscious, absolutely aware. The first thing I heard was my seven-year-old son crying. I could hear him crying. And I thought, I've got to get to my boy. I've got to get to my son. But that's when I realized that I could not move. I was pinned either to the floorboard or the seat. I could not tell. I was, there was all the broken glass. There was the rancid smell of gasoline. Now, what had actually happened, and I was not necessarily aware of my injuries, but what had happened is both of my legs had been crushed and shattered. In fact, the left leg was eventually amputated above the knee. My back had been damaged and, and, and broken, but the spinal cord had not been damaged, so I could still move. My right arm had almost been torn off, and it was cut very bad underneath it. My rib cage was damaged, my lungs were collapsed, and the seat belt had, had cut through my insides and ruptured oh, wow. my intestines. I, I, was, I, was, I was not well. I was, I, I was really banged up and, and seriously injured, but I didn't know that. All I heard is my son crying, and I wanted to get to my son. But then I realized um, that no one else was crying. And... Um, what had happened is Tamara, my wife, and Griffin, my youngest son, had been killed instantly in the accident. They, 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 um, they passed. And it was a horrible place for a man to be, you know, realizing half the family has passed. I've got a hysterical son, you know, in the back seat crying. I can't move. I can't get to him. And that's when I felt myself begin to lose consciousness. Now, it was very interesting because in that darkest, most desperate moment, what I experienced is it felt like light came. Suddenly there was this light that came to like calm me, to comfort me. And I felt as if I was lifting up out of the accident, out of the, uh, the, the scene of all this trauma. And my question was, how, how can I be okay? I could breathe, the pain was gone, suddenly I was okay and it's as if I was lifting up. And it almost felt as if I was surrounded by light, by this comforting light. And as I began to come to terms with, wow, what, what happened? Am I really okay? Tamara, my wife, who I knew was deceased at the scene, suddenly she was there with me in the light, but she was absolutely beautiful. She was radiant. She was gorgeous. She was not injured like she was in the, the accident. She was beautiful. And she began to speak to me. We began to communicate. And, and she was saying to me, Jeff, you can't, you can't come. You, you've, got to, you've got to stay. You've got to go back. You've, we, we were talking about my seven-year-old son, who I knew he was okay. He was banged up a little bit in the accident, but he was okay. And we had a conversation about my coming back. Now, I learned a lot about choice in that moment because here I was looking at the woman I, I loved more than life. And yet I knew I had a little boy in the backseat of that car that if I didn't come back would be orphaned. It was a poignant moment. And, and I've learned that every moment is a choice. We always have a choice. And, as I spoke to Tamara in this strange, you know, comforting light, we made the choice that I would come back. And I said the most profound goodbye I'll ever say. Um, and yet I got to say goodbye. And, and then I made the conscious choice, I'm coming back. 
Now, in making that choice, it was strange because I didn't have to think about how to come back. It's almost like I was just just whisked. Just I, Suddenly, I was in a hospital, moving about the hospital. Now, I have no concept of time in this bubble of light. What, what I later found out is people arrived at the scene of the accident. They were able to see to Spencer, my oldest son, and, and get him taken care of. He was banged up in the accident, but he wasn't seriously injured. Um, with my injuries, they had to extricate me from the car, and then I was airlifted or life flighted to a level one trauma center. Now, I knew nothing of that. I only knew I had crashed the car. I had said the most profound goodbye I would ever say. And then there I was moving about the hospital. And I was seeing all the people in the hospital, the patients and the doctors and the nurses and the, the families of the patients, but I was seeing them in a profound way. I was seeing them as if I knew their soul. I knew them. I knew everything about them. I knew their love. I knew their hate. I knew their worry. I knew their pain. I knew their grief. I knew, I, I knew what had happened in their lives. I felt it as if it had happened to me that there was one particular nurse and, and, you know, they were unaware of me. I was moving about the hospital. They, they did not see me, but boy, could I see them. And this nurse just passed. And, and I felt in a moment, I, I felt the abuse she had received as a child, horrible abuse. And yet in the same moment, I saw her magnificence. I thought, wow, look what she is. Look what she's doing. She's a nurse in a hospital working to heal others yeah just to clarify that you were out of your body experiencing these things right i was out of my body now i i was still confused i had i had left the scene i had said goodbye to tamra i was moving about the hospital experiencing this profound connection to everyone and that's when the reality hit as i as i i saw this body or this man laying on the gurney that i I didn't feel anything from. And that's when I stepped closer and looked and thought, oh my gosh, that's me. But it's not, it wasn't me. I was having this beautiful connected experience, but there was my body. Um, there, there was my body. And um, it, it was profound looking at my body. In fact, there seemed to be this narrative, this consciousness, this divine voice that was that was speaking to me. And you know, because it is Hanukkah and because we're talking about the temple and, and all these things, I, I had this profound download that my body was the temple, that my body was a beautiful temple, that my body was the temple that my soul would have to enter back into and live this life. And, and that the temples that we, we see are, are symbolic of our body and, 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 and us going into a temple for worship or for spiritual connection beautiful anticipation yeah yeah symbolic of us coming into our body and 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 i knew i was getting back in now again it was just the intention i didn't have to figure out how to get back in my body it was the choice i'm going back in and then i was back in the body it just boom back in but oh to, back to the pain the grief the regret, you know, the guilt. I mean, I was driving the car and it was horrible. They had a big, you know, they had a big tube down my throat to breathe from my lungs, a, a respirator. Um, I couldn't move my legs, obviously. My, my right arm had been damaged so bad I couldn't move that. And then they eventually tied down my left hand because I kept grabbing at all the, you know, all the medical tubes and equipment. And, and the hospital was very, um, very difficult. And uh, I was there for many months. Um, but it was interesting because I almost seemed to have one foot in this realm and one foot in the next realm during many times in the hospital. Like I would, I would feel as if I left my body again, just stepped aside, you know, for, for, for relief, for a break from the pain and the grief and the guilt. And, and then Tamara, my wife, was also continuing to communicate with me. We would have these interesting conversations um, about maybe simple things. I mean, she was telling me, oh, I, she wanted, you know, her cousin to have 
some of her, her jewelry and, and her niece to have some of her jewelry. And she wanted her fancy dresses to go to her sister-in-law's, which seems somewhat trivial, but she was communicating this to me, although I couldn't speak about it. I had a big, you know, I, my body was completely unconscious, but my, my soul was very aware, was incredibly aware. And perhaps the most profound thing happened to me at the end of the hospital stay. I, I was in what they call ICU, very intensive care, and I would go to surgical recovery. I had horrible infections. I kept throwing, uh, they call it um, pulmonary emboli, bl blood clots that lodge in your lungs. It would put me back in ICU. I, I was on the brink of death for, for some time in the hospital, but I was finally out of ICU. I was out of surgical recovery. I was into actually the rehabilitation wing. It had been months in the hospital. Uh, I, I have a wonderful family. My, my brothers were always there to look after me. And I found the power of, of men coming together. You know, I mean, women seem to do this intuitively. They're very nurturing, but I saw the power in men cooperating. We're, we're always so competitive as men. We want to win. We want to beat the other guy. We want to, you know, I mean, right. we want to compete. And I learned a lot about that too. But uh, in this beautiful night when I was in the hospital, in the surgical uh, rehabilitation unit, I felt that light come to me again. I felt that light come and it, and it seemed to lift me out of the hospital bed like I lifted up. Except this time the light went away. Um, the light like dispensed like a fog off of a lake or something. It, it went away and I was in the most, I was in the most beautiful, beautiful place. Um, and, and it's interesting, I began to run. I was so joyful, I began to run. <laughs> and I had, I had two legs in that, you know, I mean, here in this realm, I, I have one leg and the other one's badly injured and I, I won't be running in this realm, but in that realm, I was running. But it was such a physical experience. It, it, I could feel it. I could feel the energy in every muscle of my leg, and I could feel the energy in the ground beneath my feet. I was, I was so joyful. And and I, the only word I could come up with because people have said heaven. You know, people say oh the other side or the spirit world. The only word that comes close to how I felt was I was home. I was home, I was so happy, and I was so welcome, and it was so peaceful, and I was running and, and feeling everything. And um, You are saying home, and Hila here is uh, gasping because uh, she feels the same, you know? She had uh, her near-death experience, and uh, that's what I hear from her all the time, this word, homesick. Uh, homesick. Term. Yeah. Yes. You know, it felt so familiar. And, and so home and, and, and the interesting thing that happened when I was there is I knew intuitively that I was to go down this, it was like a corridor, I was to go down this way and, and I did. And as I went down the corridor, there was a crib, a, a baby's bed, you know, at the end of the corridor and my, my, my youngest son, my little one that passed in the accident, he had been sleeping in a crib, you know, when he was in this life just before the accident. And I raced to the crib and I looked in and there was my little boy. There was my little Griffin, beautiful, sleeping. I, I picked him up. In fact, I, he, he was perfect and it was physical. I could, I could feel him. I don't know if you've ever picked up a, a sleeping child. You know, you feel <laughs> the weight and the heat and the softness. And, and I, I held, I, I, could, I could feel him against me and I was thinking, I'm out of the body. I'm, I'm in spirit, but everything feels so real, so tangible, physical. It was it, it, it almost, and it was beyond the physical in this realm. It was, it was, it was sensual, not in a, you know, not in a romantic way, but like, gosh, there he was. And I could feel him breathing and I could feel his breath on my neck. And I, and I, I, I leaned over, um, I smelled his hair. I'm, I'm like, it's really him. I could smell his hair. It's like, this is my little boy. And I began to weep. You know, I began to weep holding him. 
And as I held him, I, I felt an intense presence behind me, a very powerful, cosmic, overwhelming presence. Now, in my upbringing in religion, I, I began to be fearful because I thought, oh, that's, that's God. And I'm, I'm probably in trouble because my little boy died because I crashed the car. You know, his life was cut short because I, I lost control and, and wrecked the car. And I, I felt the guilt come up and I thought, oh, that's God. And I'm, I, I'm, I, I felt so horrible. Yes. And I had this thought. I had this thought of, I hope somehow I can be forgiven. And when that thought came up, and this almost felt physical too, I felt these beautiful divine arms wrap around and hold me and my little boy. And there was this downpouring of pure, unconditional love. Wow. In fact, the, the message was there's nothing to forgive. Everything is in perfect divine order. Your little boy is here, but he's not dead. He is, you know, he's alive and you're alive and everyone's alive. Everything is in perfect divine order. And I had what they call the life review. I didn't know at the time it was called a life review, but I began to, I began to see my life. And I saw these things that I was thinking, oh, that, that was a mistake. I didn't mean to do. <laughs> and this beautiful, this beautiful being that, that I call God was saying, that's your judgment of it, not, not ours. We love you. You are as precious and as perfect to us as the little child, your, your baby son that you hold. We love you. And, 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 and it was a personal experience, but I realized that was all of humanity. We love you all that dearly. You are that known. You are that beloved. You are that perfect and precious to the divine. And with what you call your flaws. Yeah. 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 And, and it was it was beautiful. And and I was also taught about choice. I was told that I could be angry at God my whole life because half of my family died. Or I could be angry at myself. I could continue to beat myself up and have the guilt. Or I was told that in all that perfect love, I could make a choice, that I could, I could give my son. I could give my son back to God. I could let go and, and release not only him, but even my wife if I chose and, 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 and exercise my will in this scenario. And in all that love and in all that beauty, I was, I was able to kiss my little boy. And, um, and I gave him back. And, uh, and then I came to myself. I woke up. I, I was back in the hospital bed to the injuries and the amputation and all that went on. But it was, it was very profound to experience the divine in a way that was far different than, than I had. It, it was pure, unconditional love. I had grown up being afraid of all of that. But when I experienced it, it was so loving and so welcoming and so accepting that, that all of that fear went away. And, um, and I came back wanting to be a manifestation of that love. Wow, what if I could love people like that? What if I could allow people to feel like I felt? And, and my fear of death completely went away. I thought, wow, I, I, I love Hilda how you say homesick. Because yes, it's like I want to feel like that. Um, and it was difficult. I, I, I eventually got out of the hospital. I had to come home. And, and that was beautiful because you must recall, and I'll get to questions here in just a, a minute or two. I mean, I had a seven-year-old son who had survived the accident too, and he had lost everything I lost. He had lost his mother. He had lost his brother. In many ways, he had lost his father too. I was never going to be the same. I, I was returning home in a wheelchair. I couldn't use my right arm. My left leg was cut off. My right leg was in a big brace. And my brothers would have to lift me out. They, had to, they would have to pick me up and put me in the wheelchair. And they had been looking after my son as well. And when I came home, I was so worried. Like, how is he going to deal with this? How is this little boy going to deal with me as this broken father? You know, and um, it was interesting because I returned not to my home. I had to go stay with my brother for a while in his home. 
and my son Spencer was there. And when they brought me home, there was there was Spencer looking out the window as his uncles, my my brothers, were lifting me out of the car and putting me in the wheelchair. And I thought, oh, I, I look horrible. This is going to be hard for him. And I began to navigate the wheelchair. It was an electric wheelchair. I could drive with my one good working left hand. And I began to turn and, and my son came running out of the house and he ran toward me, but he ran right past me. He, he went past and I thought, ah, oh, this is gonna be so hard for him. And I began to navigate up to the ramp and my brothers had built a ramp and they were, they were insisting that I do it myself and get the wheelchair into the house so that I could become accustomed and, and more self-sufficient in those things. And as I turned, I just looked to see where my son Spencer went and he had actually run across the street and he was, he was knocking on the doors of the neighbors. And he was shouting, come out, come out. My dad has made it home. Come see my dad. <laughs> and I, I thought, oh, you know, and he, um, he, he eventually came and he did, he did, he, he jumped up on my lap, which just about killed me because I still, I still had all the sutures <laughs> from them, from them fixing the, you know, the broken intestines. But it was a happy pain. It yeah. was a happy thing. And I, I bring it up for a specific reason. It was happy pain. Yeah. And, and um, he threw his arms around my neck and I said, look, I'm going to be like this for a while. I'm going to work very hard to get well. But can you deal with this? And he's a grown man now. He, we, we laugh. He said to me, he said, dad, if you were nothing but a puddle of blood, I would still love you. And um, I, I, here's what I realized. That was love. That was unconditional love. That was the same type of divine love that I had experienced in those other realms. And as I, as I held my living son in a wheelchair here on this earth, I realized that was no less divine than holding my son who had passed in that realm. I mean, suddenly mm -hmm. heaven was right here. There, there was nowhere to go. There was nothing to become. It was to simply be in that perfect moment and enjoy heaven right here. And, and that connection, that unconditional love that we as humanity could share with each other if we chose to. Now, I eventually was fitted with a prosthetic limb. I learned to walk again. I got back to work. And I'll, I'll, I'll be very brief about this because I want to get to questions, but I actually even fell in love again. I, I remarried Tanya, my current wife came into my life and she's been a beautiful, beautiful support. We, um, we adopted two boys. I, I don't call them my adopted sons. I, they're just my boys. They just came to our home in a different way. And we rebuilt a family and, and, and not that it's easy. I grieved as miserably as anyone, but I had these beautiful near death experiences that are probably what saw me through it. But at that point, let's, let's have a conversation. Let's have a dialogue. It's always far more interesting than the monologue. Thank you for sharing that with us, yes. uh, Jeffrey. Oh, you're so, you're so welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think it's never uh, over, maybe, like as long as the years go, goes by, it, uh, it, it, it becomes the experience more uh, vivid. Uh, do you feel the same way, like as that you remember more, it's, do you feel that the same way? I, I do, it's interesting. I mean, it's been many years since the accident now. More than 20, right? Yeah, it's been 20, uh, 23 years actually. Wow. But the the out of body or the near death experiences are like yesterday. I, I will never forget those. I've forgotten details about the hospital and how many surgeries. I had to ask my mother how many surgeries. I had eighteen surgeries in all, putting me back yes. together. I, I I those details didn't matter. But the near death experiences or the out of body experiences, uh, they they are so profound and so crystal clear. I I remember them like they were yesterday. And, and I have a, I have an assumption or idea why because you don't experience it through the brain, you experience ah. you experience it with your consciousness. I that, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, that's actually. the great debate: is the consciousness is made by the brain or it's outside of the brain and uh, beam to it, or uh, you know the brain is like a filter to the consciousness. I think that makes perfect sense, and 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 and, and, and Hila will understand this too because that 
was what was real. Th- th- this life, the day to day, that now this feels like the stupid, weird, foggy dream. Yeah. That was real. That that was reality for me. Now, yes. Do you still feel that you're half here and half there? Oh, you know, I yes, yes, I do. I do feel like I kind of weave between the worlds. <laughs> say, say again. It's not encouraging me. It's not encouraging her. <laughs> I, I I know. I want to be honest with you, and and yeah. I do sometimes. It's gotten easier. It's gotten better. You know, um, I'm not as homesick as I was because I'm I'm embracing the gift and the gifts I have here, um, and realizing that maybe I can make heaven here. I can bring heaven here. I can bring that love and that clarity I experienced there into my life here and surround myself with like-minded people, and then I'm not so homesick. <laughs> That's interesting because people that I remember when I broke my shoulder and I gave a lecture, you don't know this story, listen. And after the lecture, a woman came to me and she said, How did this happen to you? And I said, well, I was uh, on my corky night listening to music with my dog. And, and she said, no, no, no. How it happens to you? And I said, yeah, I, I fell down. <laughs> no. And then I understood that people think that people who had NDE or were, or were in the other world, well, actually, we all have been in the other world. We just don't remember. But people think that there is no difficulties to uh, people who had this experience. And I think that uh, according to what you said, that one of the challenges to us is to integrate the love that we, we were there into this dream. <laughs> For me, it's still a dream. <laughs> so true. how do you deal with difficulties? And that you know that, okay, now I'm, I have a difficulty with something, but it's all about love. So. How do you manage those things? That's, that's a very good question. And, um, and, and here's, and, and I learned this, you know, through the experience, perhaps. I mean, one, one thing I, I, I often say, well, I've been through worse, so I'll get through this. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I always ask myself, what am I learning? You know, what, what is love teaching me in this situation? You know, someone might do something horrible to me or say something, and then I say, well, it's never about them. What am I learning? What, what am I, how is my soul expanding and growing through this? And, and, and what is love teaching me? Because in what I experienced, I realized, well, everything is love there. So if it's happening to me here, there must be some source of love within it. And then it's up to me to, uh, to discover that and say, okay, what am I learning? I, for instance, you know, I don't walk very well now. I limp and I often use a cane because I, my le- you know, I, I, I have one leg and the leg I have is not a good leg. And there was a day I was angry. I'm like, why? You know, why, God? Why do I, you know, why is it like this? And I, I shifted and thought, but what am I learning? And there was all of a sudden this beauty of, You walk slower. You smell the flowers now. You see things that you would not see if you were hustling and bustling through life. This is a gift to you for you to slow down, to be conscious, to feel the ground under your feet and feel the wind in your hair Amazing. and embrace every step. Yeah, every step is a gift. Every step is a beautiful gift. And I'm like, oh, Wow, okay, now I can think of that differently. It's an amazing way to look beautiful. at things. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. One of the things that I was uh, very excited by them that you said in one of your interviews, that the war- when you were the, uh, beyond to this mm-hmm. world, you were asked in what measure or degree you learned to love. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I, I can. I mean, I, I grew up in religion teaching me that God was judgmental and that I life was a test and I must measure up and I must do everything correctly, right? And 
when I was in that realm, I call God. And when I was in those arms that were so loving and so beautiful, there was no judgment. And there was only one question that, that even came up. And the question was, to what degree have you learned to love? Mm. And it's been interesting how that's played out around, along the years and over the years, because now that I'm, you know, gray and it's been 20 years since that happened, it was also about myself. To what degree have I learned to love myself? You know, I became very loving to other people. And, oh, I wanted to assist and serve and take care of and, and do kind things, which is beautiful. Those little random acts of kindness bring me my greatest joy. But I was still forgetting to love myself and to be kind to myself. And so now when I look back over two decades and say, when I was asked, to what degree have you learned to love? Well, I love others at a much deeper level but I've learned to love myself at a different level. And I've realized I can only give what I have. And if I have self-love, then I have more love to give others. And um, that was a beautiful question, but that was the only question. It wasn't like, what about your life? And how come you didn't do this? And you did you do all your prayers? And, you yeah. know, it wasn't that. It was just absolute unconditional love with a question of, have you learned to love to this degree? And I, I probably never will because it was so profound, the love. But there's those moments when I think I get close to it and I think, wow, that's what life and death and eternity are all about, right? Yes. And it's, uh, mind, it's, it's mind blowing, you know? We're doing everything so everybody else can love us. And uh, when you need to love someone, it's the ultimate uh, gift you can give to someone. Yes. Your love, your undevoted and true love. Yes, and, and you give it, when you give it away, it actually comes back. It's like you're giving it to yourself. I, you know, it, it's interesting, the state of the world. You know, we've had this pandemic, and yet this has gone on for, for centuries. You know, I mean... It's this us and them game. I, I'm in the United States and political parties and everything's so divided. And yet, you know, this is I mean, it's the same, believe me. <laughs> you know, you're, no, you're no stranger. You're no stranger to division. Yeah, it's the same. But what if, what if we put aside our beliefs? You know, what if we put aside our religion? What if we said, hey, Christians, Jews, Islam, you know, Buddhists, what if we put that away for a minute and just connect it as brothers? and his sisters, and, and, and locked arms and said, let's create love. Let's create heaven here. Let's, let's forget about this right-wrong game and this us-and-them game. And, and what if we decided to become we, just we, as divine manifestations of that? They say, uh, when astronauts leave the, the, this planet, they, uh, they look at the Earth and then they have this shift in their mind because suddenly they see the Earth as one. And all yeah. the division, all the, the false uh, borders we, we put, uh, these uh, nationalities or religion or uh, countries, they, it's all dissolved because when you go out, you see this is only one Earth, one home. Yeah. Well, and only one, only one people. You see, that's the thing. I mean, we look different. We, we speak different. We have different skin tones, different eye colors, different languages, different belief systems. But we have far more in common as humanity than we'll ever have different. You know, I mean, it, it, in fact, it's our uniqueness that makes it so interesting. It would be so boring if we were all alike, yeah. you know. And yet I think, I think the perfection is found in our differences and in our uniqueness and in our ability to walk together, even if we're walking different paths, you know, as long as we could love and support and learn to love to the degree that you can be different from me and that's perfectly okay. We can still love each other and work together for a better future for all of us, right? Yes. Yes. Well, we talk about love and you talked about self-love and there is a lot of people that think that self-love is ego. There is a sentence in Hebrew from the Bible that says, 
love your neighbor as you love yourself. So I understand what you said because we need, we really need to love ourselves. But what kind of love? The real love that we need to love ourselves. Well, I, it's a beautiful question. And, and it's funny because before the accident, when I was young, I was a football player. I was the guy, I was that guy in the gym and I could stand in the <laughs> mirror, but I would still say, well, the, gosh, there's a little there. I might want to just tighten that up. You know, I mean, I would still do those things, which is self-judgment. And yet it, it's, it's really interesting now, you know, I look, I mean, I have one leg and these scars and all, and, and, and it's horrible. It's horrible to look at. But I can say, but I love myself just the way I am. I, I, I can let go of those expectations of what I'm supposed to look like. And in letting go of that on myself, I seem to let go of that of others. There's the, and, and I think it was Rumi that says, you only see in others what exists within yourself. So if I have judgments and they're this or they're that, it's really something that's probably amiss within my own heart, you know, and within my own self. Um, and 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 self love should not be misinterpreted as arrogance or thinking I'm better than or or you know more than or it, it could certainly just be that I am them they I am you and you are me and yes. that's where I believe the self love begins to exactly. come into play is that um, you know because I love you I can love me and because I love me I can then love you and together. We can be one because in reality we are, you know, and, it, and it's not a romantic love. I mean, I, I, I love my wife, Tanya. That's my romantic love, but I love her soul too, you know, and, and it doesn't have to be about sex or about how beautiful she is or how handsome I might be or how well the children might do or how much money someone might make. Those are just things. If we get to the core of who we are, which is divine light. We're divine beings, and it's our uniqueness that we can be in love with. And um, there, there's a play, Les Miserables, and it, 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 and in the play they rewrote the end that, and it said, "To look into the face of another is to see the face of God." And it's like, well, wow, yes, if I see the divinity in myself, then I begin to recognize it in other people. It's the namaste. You know, that, that the divinity and light within me sees and recognizes the divinity and light within you. And, and that's where we begin to find some magic, some oneness, some connection. I love it when you say, like, we need to change our thoughts. Like, instead of think as I, let's think uh, as we. Yeah. But what can we say to people who is suffering in this world and feel that this world is stuff and there is a lot of evil and they see the evil. We know that the evil is there, but we know that outside the body, it's all about a yeah. melody of love. But how can we help people who didn't have this experience to also think as we and to see the love in everything that's happening also in things that are hurting us or that makes us feel bad. Yeah, no, I think, I think it's beautiful. And, and, and it's a, it's a difficult question. I, I, I alluded to the experience I had in the hospital when I was out of my body wandering as a soul and the nurse, I felt the horrible things that had happened to her, which were unfair. I, they felt unfair. It's like, wow, she was a child. That was not right. And yet, like I say, in the same moment, I saw what it had created of her, what she had taken with those things that could be bad or wrong and, 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 and how it had made her compassionate, how she had empathy, how she was kind and loving. And, and that's what I saw is, wow, she's taken these challenges and these difficulties, and she's built them into empathy and compassion, even to the degree that she's in the hospital caring for others. And, and life does have challenges. The challenges are never going to go away. You know, I mean, my accident was not the only challenge. I've continued to have challenges. I, I remember laying in the hospital at one point, and I was looking at my heart monitor because they had all the things that, you know, the little thing goes beep, beep. Beep, beep, yes. beep, beep. 
and yet I, as, as, as I was looking at the heart monitor, I thought, why does life have to be so difficult? Why have I had these high highs and these low lows? And why did I love so powerfully? And then they died and I lost everything. And I was asking this question about the ups and downs and ups and downs as I was watching the heart monitor go up and down and up and down. And I thought, why can't life just be even? Why can't life just be easy? Why can't? And I thought, that's all dying. Because <laughs> yeah, then you're uh, flatlined. Then you're flatlined. That is not life. And 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 Hila, you will know this too. I mean, in that other realm, you say, wow, what a gift. Even the difficult things are a gift. Life is not a test. It's a beautiful gift. And even those challenges, if I embrace them and learn from them. They build my soul. They build my character in a way where I am expanded and, and I have more empathy and I have more compassion because of that. So in many ways, maybe it's not done to us. Maybe it's done for us, for the expansion of our soul. Yeah. Well, before my end, I thought that life is happening to me. And mm -hmm. after my end, I know that First of all, that it's, there is no death. It's all about life and there is life in everything. And we're going through waves of life. Interesting that you talked about that there is, there is no uh, judgment. Um, and for me, it was overwhelmed because at school, I was in a religion religious school and I was raised like if you want to do that God will punish you and if I always felt that I'm, I'm not good enough and uh, in my end experience I, I felt loved and so much mercy and compassion and there was no judgment I want to ask you who is the creator because people think that there is like a judge but it's not like that so how can we explain people who is God? And how can we explain people that love? Because I feel that I am like always trying and trying to talk and there is no word in any language that can explain this huge love. Yeah, explaining it is the difficult thing, but what you've touched upon, when, when I was in those arms of what I call God, when I was seeing my life, um, I realized that I was the creator of that. I, and this is, this is very difficult to explain, but I realized that I created it and that the whole universe, including God, supported my creation, that I was the creator of my own life. And that even, even all the players, um, you know, Tamara, my wife who passed away, and Griffin, my son who passed away, they said, we'll come play that game with you. We'll come, we'll come do that. We'll break your hearts in ways you can't even imagine. And, and, and Spencer, my oldest son, said, I, I'll walk with you. Even if you limp, Dad, I'll, I'll, I'll be there. We'll go play this out so that your soul gets what your soul wanted. Before you came here, before you came to the planet, you planned this life together yes yes it was as if i planned it and the universe supported it and i did feel there that i was eternal that i had always been and i would always be and that this was the chapter i was experiencing right now which would be for the expansion or in many ways the remembering of who i am that was another strange thing i I was in those beautiful arms, and I, I always say I was learning so much, but it's more like I was remembering it. It was like, oh, I know this. I'm remembering. Oh, yes, I knew this. I, I remember. I remember. Mm -hmm. And I remember the love, and I remember the power in, in our soul to come and create and to experience and to remember. And I, I think that's what the point is, is we're, we're experiencing in some ways what we're not in the difficult challenges of life to remember what we are, which is divine, eternal, enlightened beings. How did your experience uh, influence your grieving? Oh, wow. I, I, I grieved, I grieved miserably still. 
even with all the beautiful things that happened, I, I grieved and I grieved. Um, I cried a lot. Um, I still do. I, I, you don't grief. <laughs> you don't get over it. You move on with it. You know, it, it's, um, yes. I, I had a dear friend say it's, it's like carrying a stone in your pocket. It, it never goes away, but you get used to the weight. You know, you, you get yeah. used to the weight. I can say that after 20 years. There may be people listening that are still in grief. And, um, and, and yeah, the, uh, to be honest, as, as I, you know, it, it, it doesn't go away, but you do get used to it. And yet you, you, you tend to have more capacity because of it. It's almost like the, the deeper reservoirs that are, caused by the grief are are, are allowing a, a, a fuller way to experience joy when when that comes but I I grieved hard Henry and it was it was difficult and and I still do grief um, but my grief has become gratitude you know I'm, I'm thankful it's like wow I my little boy I I had him for for even if it was just over a year, I got to have that, and we got to have that bond, and and and, and this is all in knowing. You, you, in the book, I talk about he has come to me in dreams, even as a grown young man. He's like my guardian angel now. Wow! Um, but he he came to me in a dream. It was it was beautiful. Maybe it was a vision. And although he was grown, I recognized him in a moment. I knew that's Griffin, and I I. I wanted to race to him and, and, and he communicated that he was causing this dream so that I would know that he would never forget what it was like to be my little boy and that he would never forget what it was like to have me as a dad. That that was a, that was a, a bond that we would share throughout the eons of time, even though it was brief and, um, it, it was, it was a beautiful dream or, or vision. And, uh, and he embraced me. He was taller and bigger and stronger than me. And he, you know, he held me. And, and I felt you know, we we hugged, we embraced in the dream. It was so real. Once again, it's like it, that 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 was real. This is the dream. This is the dream. I, I yeah. wanted to ask you because sometimes they say uh, people who come back from there, they come back with gifts and new talents. So do you since you have a new talent or a new gift uh, you brought back with you? If I, if I have a gift, it's love. I came back with the ability to love more. Um, I do feel things and know things, and I do experience things. I have had dreams and visions more profound after the near-death experience than I did before. Mm -hmm. And I have, uh, I think, a deeper connection. I mean, even over this, I can feel you. I, I feel your heart. I feel mm -hmm. your soul. I feel your goodness and your authenticity. And it's a Zoom call. I mean, you know, we're, <laughs> you're, clear, you're clear across the world, but I, if I have a gift, it's, it's, I, I, I've been open to feel. And, and I, I like that. I think it's a good gift. You talked also about the silence of God. Like here, and I felt the same. Like when I popped out of my body, it was, like there was silence. But the silence was silence of love. And when I was in school, they taught us to, to pray. To pray and talk to God and like asking things like the like you come into the bank and you ask things. And after my experience, I understood that the silence is so important, is that it's not asking, it's about listening. And I know that you you experienced that too. Can you tell us about it? Yes, you, you've said it so beautifully, Hila. It, it, I used to pray. Oh, and I would pray and I would ask, bless me with this and bless me with that and, and bless my neighbors and bless my parents and bless my... I was always asking. And, and now I have learned to be quiet, you know, and, and, and to listen, to listen. And, and, and when I say listen, listen to that voice that speaks to your heart. I, I've actually, I, I've found a little test people can do, and it doesn't matter what religion, it doesn't even matter if you believe in God or not. 
I, I've had people that, that say, I'm atheist. I don't believe in God. And I'm, I've said, do this one thing. And this, this is inspiration, if you will. This is revelation. It's the voice that speaks to your heart. And just like you said, go and be silent. Just listen. Just listen. And you're maybe not listening here. More you're listening here, you know. Yeah. But ask the simple question, not about bless me and help me and may I have this or that or, you know. Ask about someone else. Yes. What can I do for someone else today? How might I serve someone else today? And I promise immediately you'll have thoughts or ideas. And, and it might be very, very simple. It might be, I'm going to call my mother. I haven't talked to mom, you know, and, and it might be, it, it might be a moment of silence where there's nothing, but in asking, I, I've had, I, I, I attempt to do this every morning. I meditate. The question is, what, what can I do for someone and I may not get an immediate answer, but lo and behold, on my way to work, someone will have a problem and I can stop. Or I might encounter someone who's having a really hard day and I can put my arm around them and say, we're going to make it. It's going to be okay. The opportunities to do things for other people um, shifted. And that's how my prayers changed. I don't talk much. I listen. And I... I attempt to make it about others, and that's when it flows. When you get that impression, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call that person or I'll leave this nice note. And then when you do it, when you do it, you must act upon it. And that's when the flow begins to happen. That's where heaven meets earth. That's, that's where the magic comes when I can be God's love, and I can be God's hands, and I can be there for someone in a way that makes a difference, even if it's a little thing because those little things really, truly are the big things. Yes. They really are. Yes. Well, last question, <laughs> because I, I have... You ask such good questions. I know I talk a lot. You ask such good questions, though. <laughs> you don't talk a lot <laughs> at all. The million-dollar question people ask me, so what are we doing here? What's the purpose? <laughs> <laughs> What is the purpose of life? Dude? 42. It's 42. <laughs> yes. You know that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, the purpose of life, I feel, is to learn, but we only learn through experience. Experience is the only teacher. And our experiences tend to remind us of who we are. So perhaps the purpose of life is to remember who we are. And from my perspective, based on my experience, who we are is love. We are love. We came from pure divine love, and we're here to remember that that's who we are and then manifest that in every way we can. And, and that's, that's the key to me. That's what the purpose of life is, is to love. I, I feel that your experience is uh, uh, objective. You were aware to this reality while you were outside your body, and you could confirm that. And also, there were another person who had a shared death experience with you, which is Jeff Odriscoll. I'm saying his name right. So maybe you can give us something. Dr. Jeff Odriscoll has become a dear friend of mine, but he was the attending emergency physician in the hospital that they airlifted me or life flighted me into. He didn't know me. I didn't know him. He just knew that they had this horrible accident and they were flying a man that was probably about dead <laughs> to the hospital. But as his team worked on me in the surgical room, he, he saw Tamara, my wife, he saw her soul in the surgical room and she realized that he could see her And she communicated with him, very simple, her gratitude. Thank you for doing everything you can to save his life. He's got to raise our little boy, and I'm done. I, I have left my body. And, and the doctor at one point shared that with me, and we became friends. He didn't know I had had an experience. He had no idea I had had a near-death experience. He just felt... And it was a nurse, because a nurse saw similar things in the ER room. They came and spoke to me about it. And we've now become dear friends. We've been friends for over 20 years talking Thank about you. these things. Yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. Jeff, 
it's our first podcast and yes. uh, so, uh, well, I, that, what an honor what a, what a privilege yeah, it's, our honor. It's, our honor. it's our honor oh it, it's mine and it's so i'm so glad you're doing this because we have so much in common I, i mean like i said you're in a different part of the world a different culture a different background and we have so much in common it, it's beautiful and the stories from all around the world from all kinds of religions and there is a an, universal a universal truth to these stories no matter what religion no matter what uh, female male country a skin color so this message needs to go out and as much yeah. as as, uh, as and we- thank you so much for helping us to spread the The world I'm sure that the day will come and we will meet not only there but I'm talking about this <laughs> right here, <laughs> yeah, yeah. here in Israel outside Israel and uh, just a matter of time so thank you very 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 much thank you very Jeffrey. much Jeff thank you and uh, uh, happy Hanukkah <laughs> happy happy Hanukkah to you too thank and you. I would love to come to Israel it's been many years since I was there and Yeah. And I love your country. I love the feeling, the feeling, the history and the power of, of all the people that come there for so many different reasons. It's, it's a beautiful and a sacred place. And uh, I felt that when I was there. It was a beautiful and sacred place. So I hope to come back soon. I would love that. Thank It would be very nice. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you so Thank you. much.